The femme fatale. She's got a secret. She's got a past. And she's out for one thing. They hang you for a thing like that. She's the beautiful and seductive woman luring some desperate man to his destruction. Among some of the greatest, there's Phyllis Dietrichson, played by Barbara Stanwyck in Double Indemnity, Jane Greer's Kathy Moffat in Out of the Past, and Savage's Vera in Detour. And then there's Ellen Barrett, played by Jean Tierney in 20th Century Fox's 1945 Laureate Technicolor production, Leave Her to Heaven. She's got no secrets or a past, and she's not motivated by money. She's got enough of that on her own. Instead, she's driven by obsession and pathological jealousy. And the object of all this is her own husband. What's wrong with Ellen? There's nothing wrong with Ellen. It's just that she loves too much. I read a quote that described Ellen as menacing, father fixated, deranged, and unstable. And yes, all are correct. So let's get into Ellen's story, because she is 100% femme fatale and probably the most cold-hearted and evil of them all. When socialite Ellen Barrett and author Richard Harlan meet on a train to New Mexico, Ellen is immediately intrigued. Oh, I'm sorry. I was staring at you, wasn't I? I didn't mean to, really. It's only because because you look so much like my father. He looks a lot like her father. I noticed it the minute I saw him in the club car. His face, his voice, his manner. It's uncanny. And Richard is obviously intrigued by this beautiful woman who can't keep her eyes off of him. Ellen and her mother and her sister have come out west from Boston to spread the ashes of her father. And I can't stress this enough. Ellen really loved her father really loved him. Ellen and Richard quickly fall in love, very quickly, and within a matter of days, Ellen proposes marriage. Will you marry me? After she gives her current fiance, lawyer Russell Quentin, the brush off. I'm in love. We intend to get married at once, tomorrow. Ellen and Richard marry and everything seems perfect, except Ellen doesn't want to share Richard with anyone. She is pathologically and murderously possessive. I don't want anybody else but me to do anything for you. Richard is hers, and anyone who shows him any attention or affection will feel Ellen's wrath. That includes her mother, her sister, Richard's younger brother Danny, who is recovering from polio, and her own unborn child. Look at me. I hate the little beast. I wish it would die. Much of this film plays like a romantic and marital melodrama, and that was the genre the film's director, John Stahl, excelled at. He spent much of the 1930s crafting some of the best melodramas of the era. Backstreet, Imitation of Life, and Magnificent Obsession. But Leave Her to Heaven was something different. A film with very dark themes set in brilliant daylight. Its scenes are sun-drenched, wide-open, natural environments and in bright and well-appointed spaces. It's important to note that in the 1940s, very few Technicolor films had a contemporary setting. Technicolor was reserved for musicals, adventure, fantasy, and historical films. Realistic dramas were not filmed in color. In fact, the president of Technicolor Corporation even went so far as to say if a story has been conceived, planned, and written for black and white, it should not be done in color. The film is beautiful, and it's jarring when things begin to take a dark turn. And while the iconic noir imagery of shadows and black and white and high contrast lighting are missing, Leave Her to Heaven sets a definite noir mood with its undercurrent of discomfort and unease and paranoia. And when viewed alongside a film like 1945's Mildred Pierce, another female-centered noir, Leave Her to Heaven, like Mildred, it's a noirish thriller that's masquerading as a marital melodrama. And really, up to a certain point, Ellen is a sympathetic character. She wants to spend time with her new husband, and people keep intruding. Do you know, ever since we've been married, we've never been alone, not for a single day. Her brother-in-law. Hi, Hi, good morning, Danny. Morning, Ellen. Hi, Danny. Her mother, her sister, and she's jealous. She has a jealous streak. 
I mean, that's an understatement. But her casual cruelty when dismissing her fiancé for Richard and the unspoken resentment and anger she directs towards her mother. Father and I used to come here every spring, year after year. And occasionally Ruth came along, but never mother. Well, those are all red flags. And then Ellen lets her mask slip. And I'm just as happy as he is that Danny's doing so well. But after all, he's a cripple. And she reveals her true self for the first time. I want you to tell my husband that it would be better for Danny to stay here at Warm Springs. But that isn't true. And we see that Ellen has been playing a role to hide her pathological inner wants and needs, which are obviously selfish and self-serving. And in this film, everything is too perfect and composed. The setting, the interiors, the color schemes, the clothing, and especially Ellen. And this is where the Technicolor pays off. Richard is sucked in by her beauty and perfection, and he falls for the act. Because all that beauty in the surroundings and in the warm colors of the domestic spaces and in the innocent pinks and yellows and the calming shades of greens and blues that enhance and play up Ellen's eyes are deceptive. The perfection becomes overwhelming and unrelenting, and it goes from enviable to disturbing. This is a dark, cold-blooded story, and when Danny gets in the way, her facade of the loving sister-in-law breaks. And when her own unborn child gets in the way, well... And when she suspects her sister of stealing her husband's affections, and the state will prove that the defendant, Ruth Barrett, deliberately and maliciously plotted and carried through the murder. And all of this is really subversive. Ellen's maniacal enthusiasm for housekeeping and being the perfect and dangerously devoted wife to her husband turns the post-war domestic ideal into a nightmare. And Jean Tierney is perfect as Ellen. She exudes an aristocratic coldness and remoteness. Her intense green eyes glow in technicolor and can flare with emotion or go dead when she's committing the most heinous of crimes. There is some debate as to whether Ellen is an actual femme fatale or if the film itself is even a film noir. Critics argue that Ellen does not seduce Richard into acting against his interest or breaking the law. So she's not really a femme fatale. But she does seduce him into ignoring about a dozen red flags, and that leads to tragedy for Richard and everyone he cares about. I don't see how you can deny Ellen the title of femme fatale. What's wrong with Ellen? There's nothing wrong with Ellen. It's just that she loves too much. There are eight million stories in the cinema cities. This has been one. <laughs>